What's the theme going to be? Well, the theme is going to be the many, many varied uses of Point Lobos, how it's recovered from all of this. And it became the probably the nicest small museum in the state parks. People come here, there's so much here that people have no idea about. So Kirk started collecting artifacts, and that's what we're going to kind of look at. I'll give you a quick rundown of how the building got to where it is today, but the, the artifacts are, are pretty varied. And we can either go chronological from where they were in history or when we got them, or let's go by room by room. Normally, you go into a museum, there's some sort of a flow to it. You go, well, here, this wall's got enough space for this exhibit. <laughs> this wall has this exhibit. It may not be related, but there's enough space here. So let's just, so I don't even try and go into sequence of this. This is just Elder Skelter. We'll go to the pump first since I'm standing here. There was two of these pumps that were used by the Japanese guy, Ruth Kibanis, and one of them was lost overboard, and this is the second one. Uh, Seizo Kibani, the man who did the canning here was his father. I can never pronounce it, Jinnisuki, I believe. His, this is his son, Seizo. He had his father's inherited stuff. He got the pump. And he kept wanting to give it to us. We said, we don't have any place to display it. And I don't like people just to give us things to put them in a, a warehouse somewhere. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Hang on to it. Well, finally, he gave it to the aquarium because we weren't doing anything here. Well, then we started doing this museum. And so Kurt went to the aquarium and said, hey, we know you have that pump. And you're not using it. So they loaned it back to Point Lobos. So John Hudson went through it, he cleaned it up, he got it working, and they didn't have this plexiglass around it at first, and I, I liked it better the other way. It was noisy, but the kids could come in here, they get one on each end, they get this thing pumping, and the nozzle would blow air out of it. So, to me, are you going to hurt it really by hanging on to this thing after it's been out on boats and in the water and doing all this? So, but anyway, someone uh, other than I decided that it was not safe or it was too noisy. It was irritating. I, you know, if you had to work in here and had this pump banging around, so I could see that. So anyway, the pump got made non-functional. There was two of these. And they, with this pump, the divers could dive to 12 feet deep. That's a 12 feet deep. Not very much. That's it. Not 30. Not 30. Oh, my gosh. Real shallow. Well, I'm, I'm saying that from uh, talking. We had a, a, a second generation diver. I don't remember his name. Came in. There's a there's a video probably up in the office about about him, and, and he came in and did this whole talk about this pump. He was here with Sandy Lyden. Have you guys met Sandy Lyden? Yeah. Yes. He's kind of a kind of a crazy historian from Cabrillo College. He and I always kid each other. He, he said this was Chinese or Japanese or Chinese. Or I said no, it's whalers. No, it's Chinese. And so he wrote this book, Chinese Gold. And he showed this as being a Chinese building. Well, finally, he wouldn't tell us how he, how he knew that. Well, when he got all done, he said, well, you guys have a map here at Point Lobos that I looked at. And it shows, it was done, I, I think I talked about that last newspaper article about the name of the whale's cabin. And it shows this as being the Chinese village here. The Portuguese were in the back of the meadow over here, and the Japanese eventually on the point. So the map shows this is Chinese. Well, we still, I still don't say it's 100% sure that it's Chinese, but probably 95% sure. So we call it Chinese now. So that was from Sandy Lyman. So pump, let's see. Um, that's good. Cool. I thought the artifacts, the Chinese artifacts, showed that it was Chinese as well. Uh, yeah, there's Japanese artifacts too. Oh, no. But they were, came after the Chinese. We know the Japanese used They used this for two years to process abalone. They had their, their counting tables in here and they would slice it and they, and they did the canning here. You can see some of these cans. This was another thing we probably should have done. Those were original labels. We should have reproduced those and not used the originals because now they're not gone. There was a print of olives actually. One of the docents was working the canner or it was some kind of a. Of a Order or big magnet type person in the cannery, and he got us these pretty olive cans, just saw the wire and we put the labels on those. We still so, have some more of those, by the way. We have more labels. Have Kurt's uh, archive. Okay, we should take and reproduce the labels. <laughs> Not a lot there. of them, but no. some. Yeah, the box, there's a, that's the one of the original boxes, too. Wait a minute, so those are olives in there? There's nothing but just salt water, but they were olive cans. That's, they were not, there's no abalone in those. Yeah, so I, when, I, when I was trained, we were told there was, that those were original cans with that one. The original labels, that's all. The whole stack of the labels. You have some of the labels? Yeah, yeah. 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 We'll move around a little further. Let's look. Uh, Native American display. I lived in the Hudson house just before my phone rings. It's Kurt Lowe. He says, I found something fantastic. 
<laughs> What'd you find, Kurt? Well, he was at a garage sale in Monterey, and they had these artifacts for sale in the garage sale. And normally, you don't want to buy this kind of thing, because then you start to create a market for it, and the last thing you want people to go out pot hunting and then selling these things. But they've already been poached or gathered, and if we don't buy them, somebody else will. And if we buy them, we can bring them back to Point Lobos. They were from Point Lobos, from Point Lobos Ranch. Actually, they were across the highway. And it was the Monterey Archaeological Society under the guy named Don Howard did a dig out there. He and his wife headed it up, and it was, it was an amateur archaeological uh, club, Monterey Archaeological Society, and I was a member. I never did any digging with them, but I got their little circulars and things. So Kurt said, what should I do? I said, well, buy them. And so he paid $400 for all these stuff. And this, these were being sold by Don Howard's ex-wife. They were divorced. She got the artifacts. He got the field notes. And so she decided to make some money and sell all the artifacts. So then Kurt had another fantastic idea. He went to Don and said, look, I just bought the stuff from your wife. Can we get the notes that go with them? So he gave us all the field notes. So we had at least to put back together. And the notes went down. And we had them out here for a long time. And then they went down to Monterey to the archaeologist. And, I don't know if they're in a vault or where they are now, but they are somewhere in the Monterey area. And a lot of these things, like these beads, these were found in burials. Well, you can't display burial items. There's other restrictions. So these have been reproduced. They're not the originals from there, because we couldn't have those on display. But I, I'm looking at this, and I think the Avalonian pendants are just as I always remember them. Those got to be the original ones. So <laughs> it's kind of a mixed history. Someone, <laughs> but so you got to be a little careful of those sort of things. Uh, we need to go into that other room. How are we going to do that? Okay. Oh, the yeah. Yes. yes. They always had the best cookies there. <laughs> <laughs> is everybody in who's coming in? Yep. All ashore is going ashore. Okay, at the Belsey meeting, I talked about the bell, so you all know that history, right? You turn the bell, you can see the hole where the tide went through it. Right there. There's a picture of it. What was the hole? Here on this bell. Was you at the meeting? Yeah, what, what was the hole from? It was from wow. a farmer at Point Lobos was plowing his field, and he stuck a pine of the plow through this bell, and it was salvaged from Star of the West, which is the sailing ship that went aground here at Lobos, and the salvage was bought by Thomas Oliver Larkin and Juan Batista Rogers Cooper, and it was hauled to Monterey and sold down at the Larkin house. And downstairs was a store. There's a picture of a ship on that wall. That's not Star of the West. That's a sister ship. We could not find a picture of Star of the West. Coming around, dog hole ports, the exhibit was put in after I had retired. I really don't know its history at all. But coming around a little further, the Chinese and Japanese artifacts. Some of the stuff was found in, under the floor. There's a scales down here that was not from here. I don't know if it's Chinese, but I don't know why it's here. What's interesting to me is the shell with the corner cut out of it. Mm -hmm. This is an abalone shell buttons they were making. That's a button. This would be a button by this is Japanese. No Chinese were doing that. That's been Chinese. And when we dug out the floor of the cabin, we found lots of buttons in the shell fragments, a little piece that had been cut out, and that's where they were making the buttons. You could walk, we, we dug around the uh, board siding on the outside of the cabin, down just a little ways, we found quite a few shells and quite a few of those cut out pieces. And that was an industry that was going on by the Chinese. This exhibit's been around also because it used to be a really great scrimshaw display in here. Mm. Uh, Stan will have seen it. Anyone else ever see the scrimshaw that was on here? Yeah, These were yeah, abalone yeah. shells. It's one of Kurt's terrific ideas. Uh, he'd heard about this guy, where his daughter contacted us and said her, her grandfather was on a sailing ship and he did a scrimshaw from abalone shells. Well, normally you think of scrimshaw being on ivory, bone, uh, whale tusks, or uh, teeth, stuff like that. Well, he scrimshawed on abalone shells. He did it after he was done with it, did it while he was on shore. They were incredibly nice. And it was just, there was like, I don't, I don't remember the numbers, 80 of them or something, maybe not 80, but it was 40 or 50, yeah. Yeah, it was really yeah. something. Where are those at? Oh, well, they were stolen. <laughs> oh, they were stolen. Okay. Now, this is probably, I was probably at fault for them being stolen, but I would already retired when this had happened. But there was an alarm system in this cabin, and I was the call out person on the alarms over from the Hudson House, and so at night the, the alarms would go off. You would, Ring down to our dispatch center, they'd call me, i come down here, and bats flying around the cabin, time after time after time after time, always bats flying around. So I said, you know, there's bats all over, stop calling me. So I retired, they stopped calling me, and somebody came in through this window and stole all the scrimshaw after I retired. And 
I never caught them, but a week before, a class of college students came here with some of Scrimshaw. Oh. So, it should have been a clue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they were here a week before, then the following week they were all disappeared. They've never showed up anywhere. Now so this is a different robbery than the decorated abalone? That's it. That is the same one. Same way, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, this has been reworked really since then. Uh, one of the owners of a lot here in the subdivision of Carmelito was uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's girl. He was, what's mm -hmm. her name? Fanny. Fanny. Fanny, Fanny yeah. somebody. She was following around. Yeah. She owned the lots. And when uh, Alexander Allen bought this company, the development company, not everybody wanted to sell their lots back to him, so he had an agent go out and bought all the lots back. Kind of, another kind of a fun story. I told you about rerouting the highway to the other side. Well, when they did the subdivision, one of the conditions for the county is that they made the Cypress Grove into a park, a um, public park. And when the, he bought all the lots back, there was no subdivision, he says, we no longer have a park. So he put up a gate on the highway and wouldn't let people go into the park anymore. It's not yours, it's all fine. So he closed it off and one night county people came down, they tore the gates down. And that turned public opinion against the county, so they got the land back. So it became no longer a park. But it was just kind of the way it was. Hey, if you don't like it, turn the gate down. <laughs> let's move around further. Uh, let's see. Not too much to say about these. A whale disc between the vertebrae. Just notice the artwork on it is something that even back here, the Indians had the lonely, the, the they, they had their art. Everybody seemed to have some kind of, a, of an art that we do. Even you know, now we have our different art projects and stuff. So it's interesting that they did the work on whale bones. The lighthouse. This was in a bird cage over that um, I believe it was the uh, Riley family, which was Whistlers, became Whistlers. And they had this in a bird cage, and the parakeet, the birds had eaten the top off of the lighthouse. And they built movie sets. They didn't have blueprints or plans like you did now to make paper machine models. And this is a model from the movie Evangeline. So they had the model, they, uh, and he gave it to Kurt. And Kurt had a guy named Tom Ford, who built the model boat out there. He rebuilt the lighthouse, and this was from the movie set Evangeline. We were, um, this is a very loose, loose list. You see all these movies were made up high levels. Well, The Graduate, there's a scene where they're driving up Highway 1. Okay, so that's in point levels. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's pretty, pretty loose. Rebecca was here at point levels. It was a, a big one, Joan Fontaine, mm -hmm. or Lawrence Olivier. Down at your feet, there's a railing with five spindles. Those were, well, Kadani's, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go back in the I'll tell you that later. Kadani's lived across the street where John Hudson is today, John and Monica. And he said, hey, underneath, um, can I say, underneath my house, there was some spindles from a movie set. We don't know what movie, but they're under there. So Kurt went back, they crawled back under their house, and he found these five spindles. We brought them out, and we mounted them, or he mounted them, or had them mounted, and we don't know what movie they're from. You look at the railing on the set, but they're not the same. So. I kept thinking that somebody, somebody's going to come in and know what movie this is from. <laughs> well, I think those times are past. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we may never know what movie those were from. Evangeline. Well, then I, I, yes. have, I have a question. Yes. Uh, that, that gizmo uh, that's there beside the two whale oil bottles, can you describe what the that lamp? function is? Yeah. Is that simply a lamp? I do not know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anybody? It looks like a lamp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a cool. It says Peter Gallagher on Okay. Loaned by Pacific Grove Natural History Museum. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I assume it's what it says it is. <laughs> yeah. okay. That's one of the things we do wrong in these museums. We assume it is what it says it is. Yeah. And we start to build false history. We assume we don't believe it. Mm -hmm. So, like those, the Matani behind you. Yeah. Well, we're showing it here at Point Lobos, or the scales, or those. So, we are kind of. What do you call that? Fake news? <laughs> <laughs> Fake history. Fake artifacts. Fake artifacts. And the wall behind us here. This is a wall we took out of one piece. Remember, it had Celotex covering everything. We took the Celotex off first, and there's all this graffiti on here. What? I mean, today, you get upset, you paint, you repaint it, you take it out, you do all this stuff to get rid of the graffiti. But here, this wall has got all these names on it. They're Boosup, Connecticut. They're all, they're, they're people, and they're cities, they're addresses. So, Kurt, started contacting him. He would 
do the directory assistance. We didn't have very much in the way of internet then. But he started tracking these people down. He would call and say, hey, I'm a volunteer at Point Lobos, and we found somebody, so and so's name on a wall, and we'd like to know more about it. Well, these people were in the Army. They were all shipped to the South Pacific from here, and a lot of them didn't survive. So now Kurt is contacting their children, whoever's left of the survivors, and say, hey, I'm Kurt Lewis, I'm a docent at Point Lobos, and I found this name on the wall, I'd like to know more about it. Well, Whoa, we don't want to, you know, what are you doing? You're bringing up tough memories. But then, oh, then they got into it. And they stuck pictures and things of their family here at, at Lobos. They had a decent mechanic school down here in Wayland's Cove. And if you look on the window rock, the rock that's out here in the cove, is an iron ring on there, a steel ring. And that's left from Maureen the, the landing craft. You can see right here is the window rock. We have the landing craft here. And the Army days at Point Lobos were, well, were interesting. I read the log from the... They called him the warden, the ranger was a warden that they used to talk about. The demolition, they were practicing demolition. So there used to be a rock shelter for protecting the, the whalers. They'd go up on the top of whalers' knoll and they would watch for whales. When they see a whale, they'd signal, use a signal flag. Well, the army blew that up. And they were practicing demolition. <laughs> <laughs> they would go by on their, their, I call them blimps, whatever they their light of the air crap vehicles, and they would go over. Sea land rocks and burn they drop these smoke bombs and stuff on them and make all the seals scatter. Different times. You know, we, we're very critical of it now. But uh, they would, oh, they would paint rocks to camouflage rocks so they look like rocks. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, these are exit holes for bullets. The target was on the other side, and this is where the bullets came out. So the target was on the other side. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anything else in here that would be of great interest? How about our tree? Well, the tree was planted after the cabin was here. Yeah. So the cabin is older than the tree. Right. And, and decisions were made to keep yeah, everything. Yeah. Well, you said this, it's got it had burlap packed between the boards of the tree, so the tree had room to grow, and they would just keep trimming it as it went. Every once in a while, you'll see snakes and stuff crawling around in here. Yeah. They visit and, and garter snakes. And do, do you know where the tree? I don't. From? I I. It's got to be it's 18, out there. 1875 or so. It, 1875? I, it, is, it is in some of the history things when it was planted. Mm -hmm. And there's aerial photos showing the cabin without the tree, and then later when it's showing it with. So it could be dated pretty close if somebody would do the research. Was and, it actually planted, or did it just... No, I think it was planted. They, yeah, there was a whole group of them, the ones across the other side by the whaling displays. Those were all planted. And the Kidani, or the Japanese who were here, they, they put braces under the limbs and stuff to hold them from sagging. And, yeah. So they, they looked at it. <clears throat> Back to the other room. Good guy. Anyway, this bone sculpture of the Colonel Mission, he had it at the park office on Garden Road. And he said, this has nothing to do with the parks. He, he went and took it to the Mission, Colonel Mission. He said, here, this probably belongs here at the Mission. Well, he tried to put this display together. And the whalers were from the Azores. They were all Catholic. They were all baptized, involved with the Mission. So Kurt had one of his terrific ideas, and he went to the mission and said, hey, do you have any baptismal records and things from, and names for these families that were doing the whaling? Well, yeah, they said, oh, we have this sculpture that we have two of them that are the same. One of them State, State Parks gave us, the other one, so we'd like to give it back to you so you can display it at the cabin. Okay, thanks. And the next one, I was down at the park office in Monterey, and an old fisherman came in dragging this thing in, and Mary Wright, who's our superintendent, I was up in her office, he brought this thing in. He said, hey, I have this bone sculpture of the Custom House, and I'm trying to find someone to give it to. I can't find anybody who wants it. I said, well, I want it for Point Lobos. Okay, so this came from a fisherman of Monterey. Then we started getting this museum together, and one of the collection manager type people from Sacramento State Parks came down, and he saw these. He said, I've got the sculpture that you should have back at Point Lobos. This is a cross section of a whale vertebrae, again with Carmel Mission on it. What interested me is the writing on all these things. These were be, being done apparently as a roadside craft sale type of item. And there was not just these three, there's probably quite a few of them out there. So they just kind of made their way back to Point Lobos. The blue thing, the cheese press, was at Monterey County, has an agricultural museum at San Lorenzo Park. And this was down there in the park. And I heard about it, so I called the county and said, hey, that cheese press is from Point Lobos Dairy. We'd like to bring it back up here and put it in our museum. 
Good. It's just brilliant. <laughs> so, so that's kind of, I was talking about the, there being, being no uh, flow to this. Well, this wall was the perfect place for the cheese press, so that's where it ended up from the point lowest area. Hey, that's people. Do you guys know what this is? Yeah. Yeah, yeah everybody knows that. Wow. Yeah. Wiener. Yeah. Wiener. Wiener. Yeah. Tell us about the hat. The hat. It's not my hat. Not your hat. Not my hat. People say it's Glenn's. Not my hat. That's Jerry Lewis's hat. My hat, I told some of the people earlier, I gave it to the, you want to hear that story again? Um, the Frenchman. Uh, I didn't like Frenchmen. They, they smell bad because the clothes were always dirty <laughs> when they came on the trips here. Anyway, a busload of French tourists came in and I ended up taking them on a walk. And one of the guys turns out, they didn't speak English either and I didn't speak French, so we were not getting anywhere. And they had one interpreter. Well, it turned out one of the guys was a keeper of the game in France. He was a French park ranger. He showed, he showed me his ID so I could see. So I gave him my hat. I put my hat on him. He all took pictures of he and I with his hat. And then I tried to explain that. I was giving him the hat and that was his hat. And once they figured that out, then the whole thing changed. We became buddies. I could have stayed in contact with them, but I didn't. I just drank. They gave me a bottle of cognac before they left. I drank their cognac and never talked again. But I, it was just a lot of fun, and I, I changed my whole, whole outlook. And it, I guess really the message to me was, if I go in there with a negative attitude, what do I expect to happen? So go in there and enjoy the people you're, you're talking with and make the most of it. You'll probably have a really good time. That's that's the story of the hat, sort of. I had three other hats, and uh, I gave one to, when I retired, I gave one to my wife, one to each of my kids. I, I went and got another one just before I retired, so I could have one for my father, too. Yeah. So I, I distributed all my hats all, throughout the family. This is Jerry's so. up. We've talked about this display. Coming down to the abalone. Tom Fordham, the guy who restored the lighthouse in the other room, he built the model. Very good model building, built legal pianos, and did a lot of really nice, fine work. I mean, this kind of, kind of really the heart of the cabin to me. The Japanese that worked here, they were interned during the war. So they were all shipped off inland, away from the coast. And a lot of them lost all of their family artifact history stuff. But here, the Kanadis had the Hudson family, who took their things, put it into storage, and when they got released after the war, they gave the things back to them. So the Kidani family, they didn't have jobs or anything, but at least they had some of their, their prized possessions back. So Seizo Kidani, the, the son was still alive, and he started giving us artifacts for the cabin because we started this project before he died. But before we finished, he had died, but his wife, uh, I'll think of it before it done. She, she was still alive, and so she, she continued with us, and his, his daughter, Marilyn, was my kid's my first grade teacher at Carmel River School, so we got to kind of connect with all these people, and they gave us these pearls, these abalone pearls. One day I was up in the office, and a guy came in, said, do you know what you have in that cabin? I said, yes. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> okay, what are you talking about? So I came down there with them, these pearls. Those two pearls are worth about $20,000 a piece. I said, what? I said, yeah. That's just what I do. I deal with these kinds of pearls. Those are about twenty thousand dollars pearls. And so we don't want things that valuable. We want representative things. We don't need value. So I talked to Marilyn Gadon and said, "Hey, these pearls are valuable. We want you to take them back." She said, "No, we gave them to you." Well, they mentioned that as we got convinced them to take them back. So not there anymore. I hope that's what happened to them. No, <laughs> that, that is what happened to them. You guys all know the story of these two spoons. No. Um, I don't recall it completely. The lady donated these. She had, I believe, three daughters, three daughters and she didn't know how to split up the spoon. They should stay as a pair, so she donated them to the front rows. <laughs> Coming down, black antler. That Fuji, carved in the back of it. You don't even know this is, this is nothing compared to the scrimshaw that was in the other room. But well, this one has Fuji better. carved in it, and so does this one down here. They both have it there. This is more typical of what was in there without the carving. They would polish it like this, but they didn't do the carving. So anyway, this is the things that would, would show up, people would come in, they're supposed to came from Kadani, so. We, uh, we were looking for the helmet over here. This is new, new this is new. Don't move that away. What is it? What a toy. Yes, it's pretty modern. I would have said no. <laughs> so th this helmet we were looking for is a Japanese guy who helmet that was used at Point Lois, and Kurt, so we need to get the helmet. Mm -hmm. 
the Jaguars. So he went to the Japanese through the Japanese American the Singapore Cultural League, and so we have the money to buy this helmet. We don't want to buy it. This is your history. You guys need to come up with a helmet and donate it. <laughs> so one of the guys' daughters worked at a gift store in San Diego, and she came home for Christmas and she brought this helmet. I said, "Yep, yeah, that's what we used." So they donated the helmet to Point Lois, and here it is. So now we got the helmet. We got all the Kabaddi things, the pump, and. Japanese American Cultural League was going to have a meeting and Kurt said, well, let's have it in the weather's cabin. This is your history. You guys should come in and meet in here. So we set up a row of tables down the center, chairs, all that. And these people started coming in and Fumi Kadani. She came in and she looked, and these shoes, these guys wearing there, were on a platform right here, a little slope. And she came over here, she looked at those shoes, and she said, well, we'll go back a little further. Her husband, Seizo, had given them away. These were his father's diving shoes. And he'd given them away to a family friend many, many years earlier. She hadn't seen her for a long, long time. She came in here and she sees these shoes from her husband who had died in the last year or two. And so it was just one of those kind of electric times. And she comes and points the shoes and says, do you know why one's more worn than the other? She has to be a, I don't know. See, this one sat outside of our house as a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just fun stuff. The, the second generation diver, I'm telling you, that came in and uh, he said they like they dived to 12 feet. They would get 150 dozen abalone a day each diver. 150, counted by the dozen. 150 dozen. And the abalone were so thick. There's no sea otter here then. They already been hunted. So you got all these abalone. Very little kelp anymore because the abalone had eaten it. So they were stacked one on top of the other. The abalone, you stub your toe and abalone walking in the way of this cove. Or so many abalone. What did the abalone eat that there was no... Well, they just abalone. die off then. Yeah. At some point, there's, the equilibrium is, is so far out of balance. So now it's probably pretty natural what it is. Oh, well, uh, Alexander Allen, he was on the Fishing Game Commission, and they were talking about changing the regulations for fishing abalone. And he was wanting to show that there are lots and lots of abalone. I thought, well, if we need to you know, take smaller ones and more of them and change the rules. So he took all the abalone shells and stuff that they'd been shutting, and they dumped them all out here in the cove. It was just abalone shells everywhere out there. It looked like a big abalone. So he kind of seeded the area to try to get the regulations changed. Businessmen. Uh, the, the abalone, they're diving down there. They get their bag of abalone with these nets. They just bring them up the side of the boat. They have a hook, reach, over, pull them up onto the boat. And then the diver goes down and gets another bag and I will just keep doing it time after time after time. Well, they have these shoes. These weigh 18 pounds a piece. So there's 36 pounds of lead on their feet. they got a 30 pound lead hanging up here. And they're, oh, man, this three pounds get heavier. <laughs> <laughs> so they have two of these. So they have 60 pounds here plus the 36. So it's 96 pounds of lead. And so they can walk on the bottom. So they. Okay, I'm totally floating. So they got all this weight on them. And this is another one. This is not a Japanese suit. This is a U.S. suit. But it's, a what suit? It's a U.S. I believe Navy. It's not, not Japanese. Don't touch it, though. Okay, don't touch it. You <laughs> <laughs> might take a hole in it. So, so these guys are, uh, they, when they go down, they, they guys are pumping them up. They have the air hose hooked up. The suit blows up like a balloon. They come to the surface. They want to go down. There's a valve up here. They open this valve. It lets the air out. The suit collapses, they sink to the bottom. They want to come back up, they close the valve. They want to go down quick. There was an emergency paddle. They give the side of the head, they tip their head to the side, and it would push this valve open, and it would let the air out. Well, every once in a while, they're looking in the cracks for abalone, and they break the glass on the front. Big trouble, because now all the air goes out and we're on the bottom. What they would do, reach into their bag, grab an abalone, stick it over the front, it would suck down and stop the water from coming in. Then they close the valve, and then they come back up to the surface. Then they go up, hang on the boat. They just take these two nets off of here and put a new glass plate on there and dive again. They dive two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. And we had the, the second generation diver come and he's telling us these stories. Like this. It was just fascinating. So it was pretty common for the glass to break? I don't know how common it was. I don't think they would stay in the business for like. Was it common? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. You're asking. Was it? Yeah, I'm asking if it was I don't common. Know if it wasn't, yeah. Okay. Okay.
Great area of new stuff. I don't know history of the knives who has come in fairly recently. The wood stove this is not from here. I bought this at an antique store in Joy. And because <laughs> there was no heat or anything in there, and we come in book fire in the morning, and it was pot of coffee on like we to begin with. Not a museum, just a place to get out of the cool weather. But there was two sides. There was a firebox and an oven. Well, the Gilsons kept building the fire in the oven instead of the fireplace. <laughs> and it would fill up with smoke. So for a long time, there was a sign that was, it said, do not build fire here, or something like that in the oven. So that's, that's good. Uh, the board over here, it's a point level speed treaty seating spots in America. Don't know its history other than I got a call from a person who went to the Herald, the remodeling the house in New Monterey, and this was covering a hole in the wall. And it was all covered with paint and stuff and I cleaned it up. I don't know, you know if it was a... It was a bus sign. It was a bus, it's a bus sign? Yeah. Okay. Eric cool. told me that. It was, it was it's carried on a bus. Okay. That makes sense. And the fare box was in, up in the office, up in the attic. And it, 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 was, it said 10 cents. Uh, it said state parks on it. So I don't know if they use it to collect the entrance fees. I know in the old... Um, he doesn't like this. The old ranger logs. We talked about the, the army and the smoke logs and stuff. A record day at Point Lomas today. We had 17 visitors. We <laughs> 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 yeah, 17 visitors. And this, the aerial photos would show all the pine area as the grassland. It wasn't, there was no trees out there. All the trees that were left in Point Lomas were on this side of the road. So the aerial photo shows trees over here on the point, mm -hmm. nothing out there. And then the ranger log says, the trees are marching out into the meadow. Mm -hmm. You should see the encroachment going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Move around a little further. Pop Ernest. He had a restaurant in Monterey down. Remember the guy with the monkey? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's where he stood right where the entrance was to Pop Ernest's restaurant. So this is the corner looking into the marina. And so Pop Ernest was a builder. He used this cabin for a long time, but it was the cabin that came from here. And apparently he was known for his wearing red fez. He had abalone oh. shell soup bowls. Oh. Can you scoot over just a little bit? This guy. There you go. <laughs> so they used abalone shells for soup bowls. They filled the holes with lead, which is nothing you probably couldn't do today. And the Ernest Dolphin. So he started um, counting abalone and frying them and making them like they really are good to eat. After that, they would can them, send them off to Japan, they would make jerky like things, they would chip off pieces to chew on, they were hard, just, why do you eat this? There was a song, the Avalone song. Any of you heard of the Avalone song? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of verses of the Avalone song. In Monterey, the people say, we feed the Lacerone on caramel, cockle shells, and hunks of Avalone. Lacerone is a, is a derogatory term for the poor, homeless, beggar, Italian, fisherman. Uh, this, they would feed them abalone because that was, it was free, basically. Some folks boast a quail on toast because they think it's Tony, a mytong cat that's big and fat on hunks of abalone. <laughs> Try to do that today. You make abalone. I wrote an article for your newsletter about these abalone shells that are in here. These were made for a program called California Gold. Hugh Hauser was a, the narrator and the host for this program. And he was doing a, one on the Chinese, well, the Japanese diving for Apollo here in Monterey. So Joey Lewis was working with him, and they, they wanted to do a Japanese diver in the original dive gear, going down, gathering and put them in their basket, all of this. So one of Jerry's friends made these Apollo. They're just window shell filled with plaster paris, rubbed with sand, like a foot. This, the mail is made from silicone uh, sealer. And he made a, I don't know, a half dozen of these things. So then Jerry went out on his little Boston River boat, put him down, down in his diver, put him down the bottom for the Japanese diver to find for the film. Diver went down, couldn't find him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he just got him stirred up, making all this soap, so he came up empty handed. So Jerry went back the next day to get his abalone, and he dropped down there off of his boat. He had a buddy up on the boat. He came up with an abalone and he look what I found! <laughs> well, the game warden was up on the back. <laughs> the game warden's name was Johnny, no, John, I won't that's Johnny Walsh. And uh, John was not real popular with, with us rangers. He was, actually, they eventually fired him. He, he just didn't get it. He was not a people person at all. And so he came running down there to get this diver who was, you can't dive with 
traveling with scuba gear. And all these things you can't be doing, Jug was doing them all. <laughs> so he came up and, and John, uh, hey John, and he sees what they are. So he, he, what's he going to do, write him a ticket for getting the novel he put down a bottle made out of plaster Paris? <laughs> so I went to a, a, a memorial for one of the Rangers who worked up. He died in, in the memorial, John was there. I said, hey John, do you remember Jerry's abalone? <laughs> Rowan in one last time. <laughs> Uh, let's see what else. Oh, here. The barnacle, which is Prince was how was he used at Popper's restaurant. It was just pins and stuff in it. He threw Popper's restaurant. A little further around, the blasting machine. When uh, we first opened this as a museum, we had it working. Somebody didn't think it was safe. I thought it was a lot of fun. Great. <laughs> what? Did you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is the positive negative terminal. The wires ran to a light, and we had a light mounted, and you could push the generator. Handle it, plunge it down, it turned the generator, and it would make enough electricity to light the light. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody thought, what if somebody's touching both of those terminals? You're going to just light them. Oh. Well, if you're that <laughs> stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're certainly shocked. I wasn't, so, well, the shock isn't really going to hurt you. I don't yeah. know it, but that's. Do you remember when Disneyland opened the uh, Main Street? They had the arcades, they had these machines with two brass balls. And you would, at a gauge, you would hold on to those, and it would start out in a low current, and it would get higher and higher. You're supposed to see how long you could hold on to them before you had to let go because of the shock. <laughs> I remember that. So, I had so much fun with it because I remember one time there was a couple there, a guy was holding the ball, he had his girlfriend or wife's hand, and, you know, and she wouldn't touch the other one. All the time, the level of current is going up, up, and up. So, I grabbed her other hand and touched the ball. <laughs> I mean, we all got shocked. <laughs> That's it. The puppy dog tails. <laughs> Kurt said the best thing. The reason they changed that is because the kids were going up and down with it so much it actually wore out the gears on the on the plastic box. It could have. I you know, I suggest that would be a good project to get some new gears for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Let's see whether there are artifacts in there. Or during uh, scoring or in the dive boats that the Abalone divers were using, they would have no motors, they just have a sculling oar in the back, and they could they'd put the boats into the wind, and they would keep forward pressure to hold the boat in the wind. And with a sculling oar, they could work it sideways. If they wanted to go backward, they would just slow, scull slower or stop, and let the wind push them back, and they would just stay right over the diver that way. Uh, we're going to go out and look at some of the other um, stuff in the back real briefly. Then if any of you feel like it, there is a tree back there I want to show you since we're so close to it that uh, one of the maintenance workers in that, probably 82, somewhere there, he tied a knot in it in a Monterey Pine, a little sapling, oh. and he's grown up now. And I, I told uh, Ed Clifton about it here a few years ago. But he pointed out some little things that you can tell us that nobody knows about anymore. I told him about this tree. So if, we, uh, if you guys want to go out, like, it's on the old trail right behind us here. So if you, you know, we got to walk through some blackberries, we'll be off trail. But I have always had the philosophy that docents should know as much as they can about my bubbles. And if that involves going off trail, that's fine. After all, the visitors going off trail, why shouldn't we? <laughs> Any questions in here before we move outside? Yes? It's hanging on the wall. What is this? The star drill used to make holes for blasting. You hit this in, you hold this up against the, the rock, you want to break. Put this in, you hit it with a hammer, and you twist a little bit, and it would make a hole. If you go down into, um, well, you'll see it in all the, the westerns and stuff where they're going to make, they're going to, in, in the mines, they're blasting, they, they make all these holes. Now they do it with hydraulic or air, water driven, or air driven, probably water driven. And to put these holes, and then put the dynamite into the hole and blow the thing apart. That's what this was for. Started off. Well, some of those holes were on that rock there. Yeah, there were holes right there. That are the tail end of, of where they were really the holes from blasting. And you can see as you walk down into where this cove, this rubble, this rock out here is from the old quarry, and you'll see holes in some of those rocks. John Hudson tried to demonstrate that splitting of these rocks. He did that on that. He did rock that on that one right there. Any, okay. any, uh, did he put redwood in it and let it swell? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. And, he, and he poured water on it and the redwood was supposed to swell and break the rock the rock apart. Didn't work. He finally got out here with his backhoe. And <laughs> <laughs> that is so typical of the way we do things. Yeah. <laughs>
More questions? What is the semicircular rock in the front? It's a grinding stone, yeah. and I know we don't, we've been asked over and over, what's the history of it? Why, you know, why is it here? Where did it come from? Right. But uh, I, mean, I refuse used to think it was probably for sharpening just knives, but I don't think so. I think it was just half of one where they would stack two of them and they would turn, and then they would put the grain in between and it would crush it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that right? I think so. I yeah. think I saw, you that see was the, broken. The question is, has it been there? It's been here since it's been, been there. That's what's been there. there. It's been, yeah. But of course, it wasn't always here. I heard, I was probably it's sitting around where it's cold in the whales where there's no electricity. The whale bone is out there. The skull that's just kind of really run down, that's from a fin whale, and that was, I wouldn't say captured, it washed up here dead. It was captured dead by the Japanese, and this is when the Allen family owned the property, and they were going to make it into more of a, a tourist type of deal. So they, they cleaned all the muscle, everything off the bones, and eventually they set up this whole skeleton. You'll see pictures of it either out in the Cypress Grove down mm -hmm. in Whaler's Cove, it's been to both places. I remember playing on it as a kid, it was, you climb on it like a jungle gym. And then, for a long time it sat out here in front of the cabin, and then when we rebuilt the cabin, it was moved up to Rat Hill, and after this was done, you know, this thing was just rotting away out here, where nobody could see it, rather than not have any of it. Let's just bring the skull, that's all that's left, back over here. The big whale vertebrae, those are from a blue whale that washed up down at Point Sur on the Elsa Ranch, and that was probably in the, mid-90s, somewhere right in there. The bailing is from that same whale, with the vertebrae. And so to go out in the back and look at that, there's the, the mining, the, the elevator, the lift, it's a steel frame with railroad tracks at the bottom of it. That's from the coal mine, the coal mine that was in Mount Paso Canyon. If you walk up past uh, Sandy Hills, place up the road past the water there, and you'll come to the old mine. It's pretty well buried in Pleasant Oak and Bush now. The old boiler is still there. There's a brick liner, and that's the lift from the mine. Hey. <laughs> it never amounted to much, the mine. Apparently, they only all a few loads out of there and it failed. But the haul road from the mine didn't come up Highway 1, and you'll see the pictures of the, the coal bunker up here, the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. These tracks only went almost to where Highway 1 is today. They didn't go all the way to the mine. It was just this last little part. The Hall Road is Roddy Ranch Road, across from the Hudson House, and it went over the hill, around the backside, so it never came up where Highway 1 is today. That's the old Hall Road from the mine. Let's see. Oh, there's some um, round buckets for hauling ore up out of the mine. Those are not from here. I don't think they're correct. I don't know that for sure. I don't believe that's what they used here in this coal mine. There's a little more from the Sierra. There's two big head wheels out there. The top of the mine, they would run the cable from the steam donkey down in the mine to lift the elevator and stuff up. Those are from here, and, and the Allen family had those. Allen's was the Riley, Eunice Riley, Eunice, uh, that Eunice uh, Allen. She married uh, Tom Riley, and then they became the Whistlers, and their family had those two head wheels off the mine.